Before we start, I want to do two things. One is uh, offer a bracha for our study, La Astok B'divrei Torah, as we busy ourselves with the study of Torah. Um, so if you know it, feel free to join with me. If you don't know it, you can just say Amen at the end, and that'll cover you. Um, so the blessing is Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotah V'tzivanu La Asok B'divrei Torah. Want to offer our gratitude to God for fulfilling the commandment to come together to study to study Torah, um, which is always a beautiful reason to come together. And the second is I want to start with a little bit of a joke, um, because that's part of our tradition as well. If you don't believe me, you can look it up in, in the rabbinic literature that they would often start their studies with a little bit of humor. Uh, for those of you who may uh, know uh, from coming to the High Holidays, I love to tell jokes on the High Holidays. Um, I will be sharing one that I've shared in the past, because I don't ever I reveal my new material until uh, the days actually start. Um, so if you've heard this one because you were with me, just go along with it. Hopefully you don't remember too much of it. Um, but I wanted to use it as a way of setting the stage for what we're going to talk about, which is perhaps one of the great paradoxes of, of the High Holiday Liturgy. So here goes. The boss wondered why one of his most valued employees was absent but had not phoned in sick. So he dialed the employee's home phone number and was greeted with a child's whisper. Hello? Is your daddy home? A small voice whispered, yes, he's out in the garden. May I talk with him? The child whispered, no. So the boss asked, well, is your mommy there? She's out in the garden too. The boss asked, may I talk with her? Again, the answer was no. Hoping there was somebody with whom he could leave a message, the boss asked, is anybody else there? Yes, whispered the child, a policeman. Wondering what a cop would be doing at his employee's home, the boss asked, may I speak with the policeman? No, he's busy, whispered the child. Busy doing what? Talking to mommy and daddy and the police dog man. Growing more worried as he heard a loud noise in the background, the boss asked, what is that noise? It's a helicopter answered the whispering voice. What is going on there, demanded the, bo the boss, now truly worried. The search team just landed with a helicopter. A search team, said the boss. What are they searching for? Still whispering, the young voice replied with a muffled giggle. <laughs> Me. All right. It goes a little over better when you do it in person. So I use that as an introduction because one of the things we're going to talk about today is the power of different kinds of sounds. And in particular, a sound or two sounds, if you will, that are embedded in one of the most poignant and famous texts that we read on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, namely the Unetane Tokef. So you can unmute for a moment before we actually look at the text. When I say the phrase Unetane Tokef, what does that mean to you? What emotions come to mind? What images come to mind? What thoughts come to mind when you hear Unatana Tokef? Somberness. Okay, great. Somberness. Who shall live and who shall die? Excellent. Who's going to live and who's going to die? Uncertainty. Yes, absolutely. Uncertainty and fragility and vulnerability. Others? Nobody? Vulnerability. Okay, great. How about any music come to mind? Is there a particular musical piece at that moment when you hear Unatana Tokef that might come up for you? Here, I'll sing one for you. Uteshuva, Utefila, Utsadaka. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Mm -hmm. Okay, what does that mean? Repentance, prayer, and charity, or acts of loving kindness. Excellent, excellent. You may also know the melody that goes with Berosh Hashanah Yikatevun, Uviyom Som Kippur Yechatevun. On Rosh Hashanah were written kind of in pencil, and then on Yom Kippur were sealed permanently in whatever it is that we are sealed into. So it's a very profound prayer. I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can see the full text of it, and we're going to read it together. 
so that you can get a little bit more sense of what this is really all about and the power behind it. So I'm going to read it in the English because I can't do it justice for all of the cantors who are out there who sing it with such power. Um, but I want to give you a sense of what we're actually talking about here. Let us speak of the sacred power of this day, profound and awe-inspiring. On it, your sovereignty is celebrated and your throne from which you rule in truth is established with love. Truly, you are judge and prosecutor, expert and witness, completing the indictment, bringing the case, enumerating the counts. You recall all that is forgotten with and will open the book of remembrance, which speaks for itself. For our own hands have signed the page. So what's going on here? What's this text about? You can feel free to unmute and just jump right in. Judgment. Yep, judgment. And who's the judge? God. God. And who's the prosecutor? God. And who's the defense attorney? Barack. Okay. Who's the witness? I'm not going to do theater voice. He's the witness. God, God is the witness, the prosecutor, the expert. The God looks like yeah. God's taking on all these. God. Things. God's it all. So God's how does that, everything. How does that fare for all of us? I don't know if we would actually call this a right to a fair trial here. The deck is stacked against us. Yes, the deck is stacked against us. We have to go before God and we have to be able to plead our case knowing that we have God taking on every possible role around us that is ultimately going to decide what? Whether we live or die. And that's where we're going to eventually get to, right? We're not going to look today at the particular part of who's going to live by this and who's going to die by that, who's going to live by, you know, COVID and who's going to die by smoke inhalation. It could have been written today. But we're not going to focus on that part because I think there's a more powerful part that comes just before. And this is it. Uveshofar gadol yitaka vekol damama daka yishama. The great shofar will be sounded and the still small voice will be heard. Angels will be alarmed, seized with fear and trembling, declaring this very day is the day of judgment. Yom Hadin. For even the hosts of heaven are judged. No one is innocent in your sight. All that lives on earth will pass before you like a flock of sheep. As a shepherd examines the flock, making each sheep pass under the staff. So you will review and number and count, judging each living being, determining the fate of everything in creation, describing their destiny. So let's look at that one phrase that I bolded. Uveshofar gadol yitaka. The great shofar will be sounded and the still or thin voice will be heard. What does that evoke for you? We need to pay attention. To what? To, to life. And, and I was thinking actually one step before you got into this, um, thinking about what our relationship is with God before we even step into Erev Rosh Hashanah. Beautiful, in, beautiful, in which is what Elul is all about, right? Yeah. Elul is all about the, the work that we have to do before we get to Rosh Hashanah so that we're ready to go on Rosh Hashanah. Great. What else does it evoke for you? I find this passage to be perplexing. You're supposed to sound the great horn, but you're supposed to listen to the small voice. I'm just curious, who here has ever heard the sound of the shofar? Okay, I just want to make sure. And how many of you, when you listen to the sound of the shofar, do you hear the small voice? Maybe on Yom Kippur, you hear the small voice of your belly because it's grumbling already because you're hungry. <laughs> So what does this mean? You hear the great shofar. I mean, you sound the great shofar, but you hear the thin or the small, still voice. What does this mean? Uh, well, does it mean something to the effect that uh, it arouses you and to uh, get in touch with your uh, recollection or recounting of the year itself, where you've got the, hit the mark and where you've missed the mark? 
So it's kind of a, an awakening of you to have an, a, an accounting of yourself or an auditing of yourself. Beautiful. So, Stephen, you just introduced the idea of cheshbon hanefesh, right? The idea of accounting of your soul, literally checking in with yourself. So it's a spiritual attunement, if you will, to check in and see what's going on. How's it going for you? What else might this? Yep, go ahead. It makes me think of the phrase, the teacher will appear when the student is ready. Okay. That, that it's time to pay attention and think about our communal world, but also our inner world and, and what we're going through or what we've been through. Okay, great. But it, yeah. but it still sounds, still seems really difficult to hear that still small voice with the shofar blasting. All right, yes, absolutely. I, I think you hear well, Go ahead, wait, Nancy, go ahead, finish your thought. Well, and, and so, so I'm wondering if, if, if that isn't implying that one needs a lot of preparation. Okay, great. Steve? I, I, I was thinking that you hear this small voice in between the chauffeur blasts, like ah. we see in between the, the letters in Hebrew. Great, right? So maybe like the letters of the parchment, there's a little bit of space in between so that we can recognize that each letter has its own purpose, each word its own spot. Um, maybe the, the small voice is in the space between the blasts, in between each of the truot, or in between the shvarim, the three blasts, or maybe between each set of blasts, or maybe that big deep breath that we take right before the tiki agadola. Great. Julius, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I think it's a wake-up call more than anything. And you start slow and you end up with a tiki agadola at the end. <clears throat> forcing everybody to pay attention. Great, great. So it's a, a mindful moment to helping us to pay attention. Lou? I'm looking at it a little differently. Along the lines of what I said before, the deck is stacked against the individual. I'm seeing the great shofar, the angels will be alarmed, fear, trembling, and all of this big stuff. And yet you, the individual, your still, your still small voice can be heard. Ah if you're in the moment. Beautiful, right? There's this possibility even amidst the cacophony of sounds around you, even with the deck stack being, against, being stacked against you, your voice can still be heard. It's still possible for it to be audible. Stephen. Well, uh, in the Talmud, there's a story of uh, um, um, Abayu, uh, Elisha ben Abayu. Yep. And there's a big debate as to whether he will be uh, forgiven if he repents of his yeah. uh, many sins. And um, he's, some of it is implies that he will be repent he will be forgiven because he's a master of torah and so yes. uh repentance is always possible to is always possible absolutely leads to uh good things i wonder though for teshuva to always be possible how much work do we need to do to clear away some of the noise that gets in the way of us being able to do the work because god knows we have plenty of things to distract us in our world today that might prevent us from doing the hard stuff. The other way I think about this idea of is what's the feeling like when you're in the middle of the shofar service and everyone is standing, if they're, if they're able to do so, for the first sound of the shofar? What's the feeling in the room? Anticipation. Yep. I also find it community, okay. I also find that people are wrapped with attention. In that moment, there's this waiting of what's going to happen in that first breath. Will the sound emerge? And so at the same moment that the sound is about to emerge, there is a breath that has been taken, a silence, if you will, before the horn is sounded. And then what happens when the sound is done? We all kind of exhale together, right? Wow, that was pretty cool. That was awesome. I can't believe he did it for a minute and a half this year, or she did it, or whatever it may be. So I want to explore with you perhaps another side of this, which is there may be a deeper play going on here, that the shofar is not about the loudness of the sound, but about trying to arouse or awaken, as was said before, something quiet that has been with us all the time. And I know that in a world filled with noise, 
silence might be something that we welcome. So I want to look at some of the origins of this particular text. So the first comes from Isaiah. This is first Isaiah. Isaiah is... Can mm -hmm. I ask a question about the first paragraph? Sure, go ahead. Like, when it talks about the Book of Remembrance, Yes. you know, it always says, you know, may you be inscribed for a, a good year in the Book of Life. It, yes. is, that the same, is that the same thing? Or it's a different? great question. So um, in this case, the Hebrew word is Sefer Hazikronot. One of the names of Rosh Hashanah is Yom Hazikaron, which is the Day of Remembrance, um, as opposed to Sefer HaChayim which we have in the Amidah, we have the Sefer Chaim, right? We talk about being written in the Book of Life or actually a little bit later in the Unetane Tokef. Uh, we are written in pencil and then inscribed permanently. It seems like Sefer Hazichronot may be the book of the past, opening up and remembering everything that we've done, whereas the writing of the book is in the future. What will happen to us in the coming year, which may then be dependent upon, are we going to live or are we going to die? If so, by this or by that. So it's actually, they work together, but they may in fact be separate ideas. And memory is something that we see over and over again on Rosh Hashanah in the liturgy and in the text. Ellen, does that help? You're muted. Yeah. Oh, yes, okay. I know. Jerry's playing around with the mute button. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. It's okay, Jerry, you'll have time to apologize over the course of the next week. <laughs> All right, so let's look at the origins of this particular text. So Isaiah prophesying during the time around the fall of the Northern Kingdom in the 8th century BCE, 9th, 8th century BCE, right before the 10 lost tribes become lost. And he says in this day, uh, in this particular time, And in that day, a great ram's horn shall be sounded. And the strayed who are in the land of Assyria and the expelled who are in the land of Egypt shall come and worship the Lord on the holy mount in Jerusalem. What's he talking about? <coughs> when is this day when the shofar is going to be sounded? Rosh Hashanah. All right. So it could be Rosh Hashanah. Yep. Susan? Uh, it sounds like when the Messiah comes. Great. Could be an end of days like messianic like experience. So it has not yet happened. What else could it mean? It might also be something about the ingathering of the exiles. Here you have a group of our people who have just been dispersed throughout the world, exiled. And this would be the moment when we all come back together which I guess in modern terms might be another way of explaining Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We all disperse after Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We don't see each other again until the next Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Then we all come back together. So perhaps the, the shofar was a sound of calling us back together. It was a, a call to arms. It was a call to reunite uh, back all in the same place. That's Isaiah. And then if we keep going a little bit further into the book of Kings, there's this crazy story with Elijah the prophet where Elijah is in a big battle with all of the prophets of Baal, which is one of the idols at the time. They're up on a mountain. The prophets of Baal think that they're so cool that they have the close connection to God. And Elijah basically challenges them to a little match and says, all right, if your God is really God, then let that God come down here and take up my sacrifice. And if not, I'll see if my God can do it. The prophets of Baal clearly don't win out. Elijah is able to consume um, his offering by, from God. And Elijah basically kills 250 prophets, false prophets. Then the two kings, the Jezebel and Ahab, the king at the time, they come after Elijah. And after all of this ruckus, all of this loudness that's going on, the following thing happens. Go forth and stand on the mountain before God. And behold, God passed by, and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking the rocks before God. But God was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But God was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But God was not in the fire. Kol dmama daka. And after the fire, there was a thin, small voice. God was not in the big, loud things, 
but in the small, silent things. It's a pretty profound way of thinking about God. Oftentimes we think about God as the kind of big, loud, cacophonous experience. But according to Elijah the prophet, if we're looking for the loud noises, we're not looking in the right spaces. One more text, and then we're going to talk about these passages. The final one, going back even further, is from the story of Exodus, right after the Ten Commandments. Remember, Moses is on the mountain. He comes down with 15 commandments. Five of them fall down, and he says, no, Ten Commandments. Sorry, that's the, that's the movie. Got it confused. All right? And in this moment, after he gives the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, it says the following. V'chol ha'am ro'im et ha'kolot ve'et ha'lapidim ve'et kol ha'shofar. And the people saw the voices and the torches and the sound of the shofar. Okay, what does that mean? That they saw the voices and the torches and the sounds of the shofar. How do you hear the audible? I'm sorry, how do you see the audible? What's going on here in this moment of revelation? Someone Nancy, go ahead. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the word I want. I mean, they're all mesmerized. Okay. They're, they are, they are, I don't know, somebody might say they all, they'd all taken the Kool-Aid. Um, they've all, they're all in, in a, um, an exalted place, space, yeah. mentally, so that they're all seeing things that one normally doesn't see. Yes. Great. Others? Stephen? You're muted, Stephen. No, no, I, I, that was a mistake. I'm not having, I have nothing to say. Oh, I know. You were trying to um, give it an example. We all saw you, we all heard you in the mute. Right? That's the Zoom explanation. Go ahead. Oh, wait, you didn't say it. No, I, I didn't. I, I would imagine, well, I will say something. I would imagine that after the uh, Torah is presented, the people are afraid and they're, they have fear. They're trembling. Great. Uh, this allows them uh, to have maybe an out-of-body experience, so to speak, and uh, they see something that, wouldn't, that they would ordinarily hear, but in this case, they can see it. Excellent. In some ways, that same sense of fear is what we have in the Unitana Tokef. The fear of going before the divine judge, the fear of not knowing if we're going to live or die, how we're going to be remembered, if our past was good or bad or checkered, right? There's a sense of both fear, your ah, and also awe of awesomeness, holiness in this particular moment, okay? But we have three different texts that become the basis for our prayer. One is the great sound of the shofar gathering us together. The second is God doesn't exist in the loudness, but in the stillness, in the quiet, in the softness. And then this idea, I think perhaps, Nancy, the word you may have been looking for was syn synesthesia, which is an experience where you have one kind of emotion connected to a different kind of sensory experience. So in this case, they're seeing that which they hear. Perhaps it was because it was outer body. Of Go course, ahead, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you. You're welcome. Was it really? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to interpret into it, but the, so the word is uh, synesthesia, which is basically the connection where you have one sense that's connected to another sense, but they may not sound logically connected to one another. And in this case, the power of experiencing God is not, according to Elijah, and not, according to Revelation, loud. It's very soft. It's very personal. It's almost pastoral in a certain way. And what's hard about the Unitana Tokef is that on some level, amidst all of this fear and anxiety and judgment, God is asking us to pay attention to the smallness, to the softness, to the voice that is within. I want to do one last thing and then we're going to get into the, the, the crux of the, of the quiet. So just the bracha, the bracha for the sounding of the shofar is not to sound the shofar, but it's lishmoa kol shofar. It's to listen, it's to hear the sound of the shofar. We have to go quiet 
to actually listen to the power of the sound. Not only do we have to go quiet, we actually have to make sure that every person around us is also quiet. When you, uh, when you say the, oh, someone gonna say something? No? Okay. The only way to really be able to hear what's around you is when we first experience a sense of silence. So I'm gonna pause for a second. Who here has ever done meditation? Any mindfulness meditation people, practice breathing and things like that? Silence is a big part of that particular practice. Why do we have so much silence embedded in meditation or mindfulness or even therapy or things like that? What's the silence all about? Let you go inwards. Okay, great. What else? What else does it help us to? Clean out the cobwebs. Kind of okay, great. Clear, clear things and start fresh. Okay. Great. Concentrate. Excellent. Others? Allow you to hear things that you wouldn't otherwise hear. Great. You might be able to hear things voice. you... Ah, the small still voice. Okay. Someone's done this before. Ground okay. Us. Any others? Ground us. Ground us. Excellent. I'm curious, for any of you who have some experience with silence, either personally or professionally, when you first started playing around with it, how comfortable was it for you? Nancy, you're shaking your head. Very difficult. Why was it so difficult? We're not accustomed to being silent. Yes, that's right. We're used to being in the loudness. Cindy? Um, it's easier if you close your eyes. Um, when you're distracted uh, by sight, um, it's hard to go in when your eyes are closed and it's uh, silent. It's very easy to go in. OK, great. Anyone else? Oftentimes, oftentimes in a group, it's difficult for people to be silent. They feel like they need to fill the space with words or thoughts or whatever. Right. Absolutely. And there's a couple of um, healthcare professionals on this uh, call or therapists or in this in this uh, room. And I think that part of what's interesting about it is silence is a powerful tool to use in therapy, but it's often very hard to sit with someone in silence because it feels like it's going to get awkward. Who's going to say the next thing? Who's going to make the next move? Catherine, did you get a chance to speak? Was that you just spoke before? Yeah, it was actually Andrew speaking. Oh, it was um, Andrew speaking on behalf yeah. of Catherine. Okay, no problem. Just yeah. wanted to make sure. So silence is pretty powerful, and it's also pretty challenging to navigate, which is why I think that for the Unatana Tokif, most of us focus on the loud stuff. Who's going to live and who's going to die? Who by this and who by that? Who is going to make it into the next year and who isn't? It's all about our vulnerability and our fragility and the fact that the world is messy and unexplainable. But if we could actually cut through all of the noise and the fact that life is messy, we may actually be able to live life more meaningfully if we're willing to be patient enough to enter into the thinness, into the smallness, into the softness. So I wanna show you a few examples of that. I'm gonna share my screen back again. Um, would someone be up for reading a little bit? I'm happy to do different readers, but I would love a reader for the first text. Lou? Sure. Okay. So this actually came from um, a series that's been put on over the last few years called Jewels of Elul. Uh, it comes out of a project that's done in LA. And um, this year, people were writing letters to their younger selves and Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg wrote this letter to her younger self. She's a, a rabbi and a social justice advocate, and she's done lots of different things in her career. And I want to look at this idea of what is it that we're trying to hear in the quiet, in the silence. Okay, Lou, whenever you're ready. Dear younger Danya, I know you're lonely. I know you feel anxious, uncertain. I know it might not feel like it now, but some of the best things that you're doing now are the small, quiet things. Your aimless evenings on the floor of a bookstore, reading poetry, the notebook you keep in your bag to scribble your thoughts, longhand on the bus, those moments just taking in the trees in the park, that thing that happens when you get out of the apartment early and just stand there for a second, watching the steam of a city just waking up, as it rises out of the potholes, 
the wonder you feel as it curls up in the air. Those are the muscles I want you to keep working. Those are the muscles that help you to hear the still small voice within, the still small voice of the divine. The ones that will help you feel more solid in who you are, who you are not. Everything you do now to sanctify the moments in between now will serve you well when you have more demands on your time that make it harder and harder to luxuriate in that place. The stronger a container you can make to hold this awareness, the easier it will be to get back to it again and again when life is fuller than it is now of needful things that need doing. Oh, and learn more about authoritarianism. Trust me. Love, older Danya. All right. What's Danya's point that she's trying to make about the muscles that we ought to build and cultivate and strengthen when it comes to the small voice within? What's she saying to us? Of course, now everyone's going to be really silent and quiet and exercise the small voice. Go she ahead, says, Nancy. So pay attention. Pay attention to the little things in life and appreciate them. And why would we want to do that? Because it will help us pay attention to the small voice that we hear. Okay. It, it, it takes practice. That, that unless we, it, it's like doing any exercise. Uh, unless we, we do it on a regular basis, the, the ability to do that atrophies. Oh, excellent. And, and so we need to practice doing it. So that, it's, so that it's there for us, so that we can go to that place at any time. Great. We stop practicing. If we stop practicing, then the ability to get there will become much more difficult. Okay. Phyllis? Um, I was just going to say that sometimes instead of doing, we have to just be and not, not to learn to accept just being and not constantly doing, which many of us have a hard time doing. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> that kind of came out weird, but um, you know what I mean. It's I true, think. and it was actually quite poignant over the course of the first few weeks and months of sheltering in place, of just being able to be, and just being able to just be wherever we were in that particular moment. We felt like we needed something to do, and being was really hard. But once we perhaps embraced it, maybe different possibilities opened up. Other thoughts? Yeah. Um this might not exactly be what you're looking for, but when um, what well, I've noticed that part of gratitude and not really feeling overwhelmed by things um, is when I'm paying attention to little little things and being ah. grateful for little things. Lovely. And what do you notice when you pay attention to those little things, Catherine? Um, I think that I feel gratitude. I feel. Um, better about what, you know, what's going on in the world. Um, I mean, I, I think that initially when we all had shelter in place, we were noticing things um, like how blue the sky was, um, you know, uh, birds or, you know, hearing more animals that we wouldn't normally hear. I think we were paying attention to, to more things like that. Love it, love it. Julius, go ahead. I think it's a matter of control. You can control the small things. The big things you can't. So like with the virus, you're under quarantine, you're under quarantine. You've got no control about that. Right. You can control what you do during quarantine. And that's sure. The we, we could even take it one step further. You can control your voice, both when you speak and when you don't speak, and what you say when you speak, and also whether you want to hold back and have a restrained voice so that you can open yourself up to listen to the voice of, a, of the other, rather than overpowering your voice to make sure that someone else is, is silenced. Lou, were you gonna say something? Yeah, just also I see think... what you don't say. What did I do? You can control on what not to say. Yes, yeah, sometimes that can happen too. Lou? I see an element here of stop and smell the roses. Okay. Take, Great. take a breath. Great. Um, I don't, we're not going to have time to look at, oh, Susan, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that I think when we look back on and reflect on our lives, we go from big event to big event. 
when actually most of our life is made up of the connection of the small spots mm -hmm. in between, and we tend not to remember those. Okay, All right, that's true. Um, I, I was gonna show you Rabbi Mark Angel's uh, piece about um, prayer, the experience of prayer in the small voice. I know that one of the things that I will definitely miss this year about not being together is the power of music. But I also wonder what it's like to be able to try to enter a prayer space, being more focused on my own prayer needs rather than being distracted by the needs of those around me or doing something different to engage myself in prayer rather than being limited to or by the machsor, maybe through breath or through meditation or through other readings or something of the sort. I wanna look over here to this piece by Esther Ettinger. Um, the picture there is actually my rabbi and mentor from rabbinical school, Barry Katz, who was actually just featured I think in the Jewish week last week for blowing the shofar with his, uh, you know, with his uh, mask on top of it. And, um, and he was the one who introduced me to this particular piece by Esther. So I, I thought it appropriate to share it. And also on some level, putting the mask on top of the shofar, aside from being um, appropriate for the world we're living in, on some level muffles the sound a bit. It softens the loudness. I wonder if it makes us hear it in a different way. Um, would someone uh, be up for reading the piece from Esther Ettinger? Anyone? Bueller? Phyllis? You're muted, Phyllis. Phyllis, you're muted. Okay, sorry. Esther Ettinger calls the shofar a naked voice, parched and insistent. It's a voice that speaks to me clearer than any sermon. It is a sound of praise, of thanks for life, of babies crying and giggling and smiles. A sound that reminds me just how tenuous is my hold, how much I want to make a difference to get my one life right. It shatters me with echoes of what is broken in the world. Children killed by guns in their schools, vicious rulers, people who cast determine the contours of their life, Subtle hatred, overt hatred, prejudiced hatred. I feel wronged hatred, unfair, unjustified fates. It is a sound that tells me that I better get moving. There's a lot to do before my breath gives out. Human lips and an animal's horn. What could be more simple? The shofar's unamplified sound reminds me to power down, shut down, log out, create real live FaceTime, Shabbat. And that's all in the first Tekiah, Shafarim, Teruah, Tekiah. Moses had the burning bush, and I am that I am. Elijah, the still small voice. For me, God's voice is the shofar, and I have 100 blast, a naked voice, parched and insistent. Reactions to Ettinger's piece. What piece resonates with you? the juxtaposition of the loudness and the softness. Other, anyone? Go ahead, Stephen. Well, there is a lot in this world to make better, that needs to be made better, that needs to be imp uh, improved upon. And we have a finite amount of time in which to do that. Yeah. And, Although there is a still small voice, maybe that's what helps urge us on to uh, to uh, undertake the endeavor. But uh, it's an it's it's a little bit Sisyphean. This is my cynicism, I suppose, uh -huh. or pessimism. But it's a little bit Sisyphean. You you it never ends. It's a right. it's a continual battle. Uh, I think I heard a rabbi back east once who said that uh, we are uh, unique in that. We we always are uh, faced with the task of, uh, of improvement, of improving, and it's a yes. never-ending task, and we're called to do it. Yes. I wonder, Stephen, to your point, how much the noise prevents us, becomes a mitchell, an obstacle, from being able to make any kind of improvement because we're so overwhelmed by it. And so perhaps the purpose of the small voice is to give us some space for a moment to think. I think and to see where we can put ourselves back into the narrative to act, even if it's just one thing or two things. Yes, I think that's true. I think sometimes all that noise and all that busyness is an excuse not to get going. Absolutely. 
Um, we're going to come back to that idea at the very end because I want to suggest uh, when we get to, to the end that we need the dichotomy, the the um, this idea of the loudness of the shofar and the stillness of the voice to propel us into action of tshuva, tefillah, and tzedakah. But we'll come back to that in just a moment. Mike, did you have your hand up? Mike Singer? No, I did not. Okay. Anyone else want to comment about this before we move on? What I like about what Ettinger is saying is that the way that the shofar hits us is actually deeply personal and unique to each person. The way I hear it is not the same way that you hear it. And the way that it wakes me up or inspires me may be different for somebody else. For some, it may push us further into the noise. And for others, it may actually blot up out all of the noise so we can hear other things that are going on around us. Um, there's two different passages that I found p quite powerful for me with regard to silence um, as, a, as a pastor and as a clergy person. One is from Pamela Cooper White um, in her book, Shared Wisdom. But I'm, we'll focus instead on the second one, which comes from Estelle Frankel, who's uh, local to the Bay Area in the East Bay. And she talks about the idea of silence through the lens of therapy. Um, so I want to share this piece with you. She says, the role of silence in fostering spiritual awakening is central. It's a central theme in the biblical narrative, as reflected in the fact that the Torah was revealed in the desert, a place of silence and a place of emptiness. One cannot acquire Torah wisdom unless one becomes ownerless and non-attached, like in the desert. In silence, the divine call that was heard at Sinai becomes available to each of us. Maybe that's the ro'im at kolot we could see the voices. As the Gera Rebbe teaches, hearing requires being empty of everything. And to transcend our current state of spiritual exile, we must forget this world's vanities so we can empty the heart to hear God's word without any distracting thoughts. Spiritual surrender does not mean that we give up our power to heal ourselves. Rather, it implies an attitude of patience and acceptance, acceptance of the universe on its own terms, rather than our own terms. I'm going to skip down just a bit. And when we surrender in this fashion to know to how things are right now, we feel a sense of peace. And she plays on this word atonement as being at one mint. Out of this state, paradoxically, spontaneous healings frequently emerge. I love this idea that part of what we are yearning for so much is becoming at one with ourselves once again, being in relationship with one another, which is perhaps perpetuated by the fact that we're so physically distant from each other, right? To move aside the noise and actually be able to enter into a conversation and a space and a relationship with another person. Any other comments about the Frankel piece? No? Okay, how about this one? This one may uh, sound familiar. I really liked it. What'd you say? Just to say that I really liked oh, it. Oh, thank you. This one may sound a little bit familiar to you. You can all sing along with me. And in the naked light I saw 10,000 people, maybe more. People talking without speaking. People hearing without listening. People writing songs that voices never shared. No one dared. Disturb the sound of silence. Something very powerful about High Holidays for me is when I can actually escape from the noise of all the preparation of all of the world and just be in my zone, which I imagine is harder and harder to do these days to find that place which is just for me, right? Or just me in relationship with another person. And I wonder if part of what the shofar is to do is doing for us is to help move aside the stuff that gets in the way. I'll do one other piece of music for you. This one may sound familiar to you. Leonard Cohen, Who by Fire, Who by Water. That's all the stuff that we typically talk about. That's the heart of the Una Tanatoka. But I actually want to focus on the last line, the refrain, which is, Who shall I say is calling? What do you think Leonard Cohen meant by that line, who shall I say is calling?
What are we listening for when we pick up? God. Maybe. Okay. Others? Another voice. Someone ah, to listen. Great. Another voice. Excellent. Anyone else? Our true self as opposed to the daily the daily uh, voice of our just going 20 different directions, but our true inner self. Excellent. I, you might also call that listening to your kishkas mm -hmm. or listening to your gut, listening to your neshama, listening to your soul. Okay. Anyone else? Well, and it could also mean that there are many ways that we can be. Yes. Yes. And I think that there's something powerful, Monica, in saying that, which is that there are many ways for me to be that don't have to necessarily be because you want me to be them. But I can just be my authentic self. So much, I, so often I feel like we're putting our own personal thoughts and labels and opinions on others, trying to impose on them what we want them to be, rather than creating space for us to just be who we are. Who shall I say is calling could just be picking up your, the phone to yourself in a very personal kind of way and checking in, which my guess is that we don't do enough of. We don't check in with who we are. And maybe that's also part of the high holiday process. Check back in with yourself because it's been a year, which is probably too long. One last thought, and then I'll open it up to questions. This is a piece that I believe, Stephen, it comes back to your comment from before that propels us into action. The idea that silence can be both healing and therapeutic and comforting and allow us to check in, but it's also in the silence that we realize that we have a choice when it comes to indifference. This is a, a passage from a speech that was written by Rabbi Dr. Joachim Prince, who spoke just before Dr. King when he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. I'll read it to you. And I think that maybe out of the silence, we can get to the place of the end of the Unatana Tokaf, which I'll come back to in just a second. In August of 1963, just before Dr. King delivered his I Have a Dream speech, Dr. Rabbi Joachim Prince got up to speak. Rabbi Prince said, when I was the rabbi of the Jewish community in Berlin under the Hitler regime, I learned many things. The most important thing that I learned under those tragic circumstances was that bigotry and hatred are not the most urgent problems. The most urgent, the most disgraceful, the most shameful, and the most tragic problem is silence. A great people which had created a great civilization to become a nation of silent onlookers. They remain silent in the face of hate, in the face of brutality, and in the face of mass murder. America must not become a nation of onlookers. America must not remain silent. It must speak up and, f and act from the president down to the humblest of us, not for the sake of the one community, but for the sake of the image, the idea, and the aspiration of America itself. I love that text because it's one that could apply really in any generation. And in particular, as much as we need the silence to be self-reflective, it also must orient us to act and behave in a certain way, which might be the end of the Unatana Tokef. Teshuva, repentance, tefila, prayer, and sadaka action kindness, compassion, have the ability to overturn the decree, literally help us pass over them and change. I wonder if that's the uva shofar gadol yitaka, the loudness of the shofar orienting us to pay attention to the silence we need and the silence that can catalyze us to go out and change no matter what we face in the world, which is the fragility and people are going to live and they're going to die and they're going to die and they're going to live by different things. And no matter what we face, we have the tensions of silence, which can be healing and cathartic and meaningful and a way of caring for ourselves and also can orient us to what it means to go back out and re-enter the world.
All right, I'll pause here. Questions, thoughts, reflections, comments? Oh, come on, this is a Jewish class. We always have comments. <laughs> I have one. Please, Siri. Um, I think for me, one of the beauties of this pandemic has allowed me to have that silence and be still and check in with myself and um, have the opportunity to have these thoughts that I probably did, wouldn't have the time for because I was so involved in so many little details. And I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I wonder what it will look like to channel some of that silence as you enter the holidays and hold on to it, even as we slowly emerge from whatever the present is, right? How do we keep that as a part of our lives in an ongoing way, in an intentional way going forward? Other thoughts, reflections? Thank you for that, Sari. Anyone? Sort of the month of El Ul is just that. It's uh, to clear away some of the uh, noise and give us time to reflect and to work towards uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So it's, I mean, I think this, uh, this captures it quite well. Uh, yeah. I wonder actually if the noise is more obvious to us in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur if we don't take the time to do the prep work in Elul, which is about clearing away the stuff and starting to check in. If you, if you hope in showing up on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, however you're going to do that, whether virtually or in person or with family or friends or on your own, not having done this work in an ongoing way, I wonder if you can really get the same amount out of it if you've really exercised your muscles enough to enter the space, to be able to get to the place of spiritual at one that was being talked about before. Thanks, Stephen. Other comments? I, I have one footnote. Please. Estelle Franco is giving a class on Tuesday night through Hamakom. I don't know if it's, it costs, I haven't done it myself, but uh, she's, as you can see by this quote, she has a lot to offer. She does. And uh, one of my favorite books that she wrote, uh, Sacred Therapy, is a beautiful text if you're looking for a way of getting into the holidays. Um, but if she's teaching on Tuesday, she's going to, you know, she'll way outdo anything that I could have offered you today. Oh, so uh, not, not at all. All right, any last minute thoughts or comments? And then I'm gonna invite um, us to offer a closing bracha together. I was yeah, just gonna say in, in past years, I never had the opportunity or took the opportunity to hear the shofar blown during the month of Elul. And one of the fringe benefits of Zoom and the quarantine is with the PSC community, how we've been getting those regular daily emails where we hear someone's Teshuvah story, but also hear the shofar. And I've enjoyed it so much and it makes me, I try and listen as soon as I see the email pop in, but it was really, it really helps me focus. And I've shared with a few friends that in future years, even when we're back to being together in the shul, I would love the opportunity to still get these daily emails because I, I think it's been very beneficial and, and I, I think it's wonderful. Thank you, Phyllis, for the compliment and thank you also for volunteering to organize it next year. <laughs> yeah, thank Sarah. I, this may not be so PC, but um, especially after you read uh, from the rabbi, you know, who spoke before Dr. Martin Luther King, that um, I just can't help but think to myself every single day that we cannot be silent and that we have to use our voices loud and clear um, on November 3rd. Yeah, I think voting is actually a powerful way of being able to exercise voice, but it's also one of those things that actually you can do silently, wow. right? It's, uh, it's a really interesting juxtaposition 
of those two pieces. Thank you. Um, and I want to also offer you the opportunity to go out in the everyday and to pay attention to the shofar gadol yitzaka, the loud things that are sounding in front of us, and also the silent things that are emerging from within us. If any of you have ever seen in Israel on Yom HaShoah and Yom HaZikaron, on the Holocaust Remembrance Day and on the day when they commemorate those who have lost their lives fighting for the state of Israel, there's a siren that sounds around 11 o'clock in the morning. And if you've ever seen it, everything stops. Like literally in the middle of the highway, all of the cars stop wherever they are in the middle of their lane and they get out and they listen to the siren. And there's this amazing, profound um, balance of the loudness of the siren and the silence of everyone pausing to hear it. And I think that one of the things that it may be offering us is that in the messiness of the world, we still have control as long as we have breath about what we're gonna pay attention to. What sounds will wake us up and what sounds we need to pay attention to internally. So I'm actually gonna invite as a closing bracha, anyone who wants to can unmute themselves and offer a one word blessing for this group. And we're just going to listen. When it's your turn, share um, and offer the one word bracha. It could be any word that you want it to be connected to this or to something else. And we're just going to listen to the loudness of the collective voice and the quiet of the individual voice. If you want to share, you're welcome to do so. You can unmute at any point and offer your word. Connection. Health. Compassion. Peace. Hope. Hope. Dirtiness. Understanding. Passion. Memory. Empathy. Love. Unity. Love. L listening. Health. Courage. Hana. Forgiveness. Gratitude. Peace. Voice. Over Shofar Gadol Yitaka, may we hear the loudness of all of these blessings. The cold Mamad Shamai, may we listen to them and internalize them and make them a part of our own practice individually so that we may share them with the collective in the year to come. Shana Tova to you all. Thank you for coming. Shana Tova, thank you. With. Shana Tova, Tova Rabba. If you want, before you go, I thought I'd offer you this. <laughs> I'm gonna ask everyone to mute for just a moment. And I'm gonna offer you the shofar gadol yitaka so that you can hear the kol dama daka yishama, the thin voice that emerges for you in this moment. Take care, everyone.